stand to our feet, put your hands together. Let's make some noise as we celebrate our King and King and Lord of Lords this morning. And we declare that he is holy. Come on, put those hands together. stand and rejoice as one people lifts in one voice you're worthy of the glory worthy of the honor worthy of praise and we will shout and proclaim the greatness of your holy name you're worthy of the glory worthy of the honor worthy of praise We pour out our best. 
church, put those hands together and pour out a praise to him this morning. How many of you know that we serve a miracle worker whose promises are always yes and amen? Who is here in this place today to move amongst us, to heal broken hearts, to cure diseases, to touch our lives? So God, this morning we welcome you with open arms. And we humble ourselves before you in worship. You are here. Oh, you're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Oh, you work in this place. I worship I worship you, I worship you. Come on, let's declare that again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you.
Can we just take a second and lift our hands in adoration to the one who makes a way when there seems to be no way? Come on, we've all been there in those situations where we're just crying out, God, make a way. God, we need you to make a way. And how many of you can attest to that? When there seems to be no way, our God never stops working. Come on, let's declare that this morning. Waymaker, miracle worker. Waymaker, miracle worker. Waymaker, miracle worker. Waymaker. Come on, sing it from your heart. Waymaker, miracle worker. Waymaker, miracle worker. Waymaker, miracle worker. Waymaker, miracle worker. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. this morning that even when you can't feel it and even when you can't see it and when you feel like you're stuck and you're pushing and you're pushing but you're not making any headway that our God never ever ever stops working our God never ever ever will turn your back on you I think that deserves some praise this morning to know that we serve a God that never stops working on our behalf we serve a God that wasn't killed on a cross and never to be seen again. We serve a God who is alive and well today and forever and he never stops working. Come on, sing it. That even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. You're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. That is who you, never you stop are. Working.
church. Can you give him praise this morning? Can everyone in this room just close your eyes for one second? Forget about who's next to you. Forget about the things that have happened this week because none of it matters. God, we are here this morning to give you glory. And God, we give you glory because you are the most powerful, the most gracious and wonderful God. And God, all of this is to praise your holy name.
and the praise is yours and the praise is yours you're the one we bow before reigning over us as we lift you up you will reign forevermore come on declare the praise is yours and the praise is yours put those hands together and give Jesus praise in this place today. Come on, you can do better than that. It's all about him, amen. He's worthy of all glory, honor, praise, power, and dominion. We give him all the praise and all the glory, amen. How many are excited about being in the house of the Lord this morning? Come on, how many are ready for what God has made ready for you, amen? Well, do me a favor before you're seated. Turn around and tell, tell two or three people, it's your day. It's your day. It's your day. Come on, tell them. the Lord. Everybody doing all right today? Amen. Anybody stay up late and watch a game last night? <laughs> Anybody? A couple of you? Praise God. Well, you know, if we can cheer, if we can cheer for them and uh, celebrate their victory, how much more should we cheer for Jesus and celebrate what he's done for us? Has he done anything for you? I know he has for me, and so we give him all the praise and all the glory. Um, our ushers are going to prepare themselves at this time, so I want you to prepare yourself as we get ready to receive this morning's offering. And before we do that, um, Adam is going to join me, and we are going to um, talk a little bit about more of an opportunity to give, and um, so we want to be able to do that. Well, I guess first I'm going to talk about Envision Sunday. So um, last week we took our special offering up again for our building program. 
And so we currently, on our goal of $350,000, we are at $229,200, 65% of our goal for this year. Can somebody give Jesus praise right now? Come on, let's give him praise and let's give him glory. And so, so what we're doing this week, or this month, I should say, and uh, all of us have change, right? You have change at home, change in your car, change in some pockets, change in some couches, and all of those types of things. So what we're asking you to do is go find all of your change throughout this month, bring it, place it in. Some of you are old enough to remember the penny marches in church. Some of you, your birthday, I know, Barb, you're not that old, Barb, but anyhow, uh, the penny marches where you would bring your money and put it in the little church box and all of those things. So we want you to bring your change because we believe your change can change someone's life. And it's all about one life at a time and changing someone's life for God's glory and God's honor. So we're going to be doing that throughout the year. We also want to uh, just let you know that there are multiple, multiple ways that you can give. And one of those ways that you can give is through your phone. So Adam's going to talk a little bit about that as he comes. Welcome him right now. Morning, everybody. So has anybody in this room ever sent a text message to anybody? Anybody? Two people. Two people texting. Okay, there we go. I like that. Okay, good. So it's a way we communicate. It's really easy. So why can't we give through a text message too? I touched upon this a little bit uh, last week as well. So what you can do, and we have it set up now to where you send a text message and you can set up a system to give, right? Uh, if you text to the number 84321, it's pretty easy, 84321, and you just send the amount as the body of the text message, the first time that you do that, it's going to ask you to set up the service. You essentially click a button, you find LifePoint Church, you enter in your information one time, and then going forward, all you do is you send an amount, you send the message, and boom, you've sent your mess, your, uh, your, uh, your offering there. Uh, for, in for Envision, for tithing, whatever it is that you want to use there. So uh, make sure we use that. It's easy. We talked about that after service, so we wanted to make sure to talk about that before the offering this morning. 84321, send a message to that number and send the amount. It really doesn't get any easier than that. All right. I think we have a video, do we not? Are we going to show that video? Yeah, there there he is. is. And I wanted to show you one of the easiest ways for you to give to your church. All you got to do, send a text message. Here, I'll show you how I set it up. All I need to do is text an amount to 84321, and a link will be sent back to me. I'll tap on that link, select my church, add an email address for the receipt, enter in my payment information, and that's it. From now on, when I wanna give, I just grab my phone and text an amount. All right, let's donate $10 now. And that's it. Oh! Oh, I added an extra zero. Yeah, I'm going to need to fix that. Um, luckily, I can. Since it's been less than 30 minutes, I just send the word refund, and that last donation will be refunded. <sighs> I'm going to try it again. And there we go. And that, my friends, is how you can give with a text message. Happy giving. All right, pretty simple, right? Hello? Pretty simple, right? Some of you already picked it up this week. We want to encourage you to continue to do that. Multiple, multiple ways that you can give and support what God is doing here at LifePoint Church. Amen? So let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us, first and foremost, Lord, to serve you and to serve others. I'm asking God that you would continue to use the tithe and offering, Lord, to expand your kingdom and to grow your kingdom in this region. Lord, we'll never cease to give you the praise nor the glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Go ahead, ushers. Good morning, LifePoint Church. Is everybody awake this morning? Okay. Today's Pastor Appreciation Day. Are we excited about that? We've got some awesome things coming up for you. And... Mm, they're ready. Oh, yeah. Well, if this is your first time, please stop at LifePoint Central. We have a nice gift for you. We want to get to know you a little bit better. And we want to say good morning to all of you watching us online. So everybody wave. Wish you were here. Adam, what's going on next week? I feel like it's such a busy time. We're always saying, guess what next guess week what? is? Guess but what? guess what next week is, everybody? It's 
celebration, Mother's Day. How many mothers, mothers are Day. in the house today? Anybody? Yes. We love and appreciate you. You guys uh, do amazing things and give us one of the greatest gifts to this world that we have. So we want to appreciate you here. We want to show you how much we love you guys. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a special service for you. So make sure you're here next week, and we, uh, we want to celebrate with you guys. Yes, and then the following week, May 20th, it's Blessing of the Bikes. Almost said Biker Day, but Blessing of the Bikes. So I noticed some bikes out in the parking lot today. Some of you are ready to hit the road, right? No? Okay, well, be sure to bring them back next week. And Lori and um, Jim have flyers. If you know friends who have bikes and want to come for this blessing, please invite them. This isn't just a life point thing. So we'll have a regular service. Then after the service in the parking lot, pastor will go out, bless the bikes, and the guys and girls will take off on a short ride and then go have some lunch. And are these motorcycles or like tricycles? These are motorcycles. Okay. So I was going to bring my tricycle, no, but I, out, I guess you're I can't out. do that. You are out. And I think you had something, but... Yeah, we already kind of touched on it, but these big orange buckets up here, again, it is May is change... Change to, to change lives. To change lives. lives. So make sure we all have change everywhere. And really, who wants to keep it around? I don't, don't want to keep it in my pocket. So what a great way to get rid of it and absolutely bless somebody yes. and uh, change a life. There's buckets here and yes. there's buckets out by the Envision table, right? Absolutely. Well, you guys, you're going to have to get a little bit more enthusiasm because there are some kids ready and they need your support okay so let's welcome let's Melissa up, to the everybody. stage let's go. good morning how are you guys doing this morning all right we have some amazing kids up here that want to show pastor and jamie how much we appreciate them and let them know how much we love them. And so our cheerleaders are gonna start us off, but we're gonna need your help. You know, when you go to a game, the cheerleaders are supposed to get you pumped up, right? Well, this is our big game today, right? Sunday's our game day. So they're gonna get you pumped up, ready for service. Come on, girls, come down a little bit farther. Come on. Come on, come on. All right, are we ready? So our first cheer is going to go, let's go Life Point. It's very simple. I know you all can do it. So the girls really want you to join in with them. Are you ready? Okay, go ahead. Go Life Point. Let's go Life Point. Let's go Life Point. Let's go Life Point. Let's go, 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 life point. Let
Can we roll that song one more time? We 
Amen. I always wanted to be on Sports Center. I guess that's the closest I can get. Amen. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a joy. What a delight it really is to be a part of just such a tremendous family. Amen. Just a just a wonderful, wonderful blessing. I'm truly um, humbled by your generosity and your love and your support. You know, we gathered this morning as we do every Sunday morning as we come together and um, make this our church. And uh, we huddle after we're done setting everything up. And um, Nate gives us a devotion and we pray together. And I was standing there and I was just watching and looking at everyone. And it dawned on me that there were more people standing around in that huddle than we had on our first Sunday here at Life Point Church. God is awesome. God is so awesome. And um, we're so thankful that God has allowed us to partner with you to make a difference in people's lives as we see one life at a time change for the glory of God. I am so honored. I am so blessed to have a dear, dear friend of mine with us this morning. And um, Pastor Chad was with us three years ago. So he was with us at the very early stages of Life Point Church. And um, so he's been able to kind of watch us and just to be a part, see what God is doing here at our church. And um, some of you may remember Pastor Chad. The time that he was here, him and his family were uh, in the middle of an adoption stage of a very precious young lady in South Africa, Africa, West Africa. And uh, there were some, there were some complications, some setbacks, some hangups, and um, just praying and believing that God was going to open the door for them. And we we felt impressed to sow and to give in an offering to help them in that endeavor. And uh, long story short, I believe we have a picture of her. Her name is Eden. Well, there's the family. I'll, I'll start with the family. We have Zach, and we have I'm sorry, Ezekiel. That's Zach. Zeke, sorry. Elijah, Eden, and Everly. Everly, all right. And here they are, just a beautiful, beautiful family. And to God be all the praise. And to God be all the glory. There she is. Isn't she wonderful? Praise God. Amen. And his wife, Karen, who's unable to be with us today, just a beautiful, beautiful family. Let me tell you something about what God is doing in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Anybody ever heard of that place? A couple of you, a couple of you. Anybody ever heard of the Greenbrier? More of you? Okay, that's where they're located. In the metropolis of White Sulphur Springs, where there are 2,000 people who reside there. Listen to this. Of those 2,000 people in that area, Bethesda Church, whom Pastor Chad leads and has for the last 10 years, started with 70 people. Today, they minister to over 1,100 people on a Sunday morning. (laughs) 1,100 people on a Sunday morning of a town of 2,000. That's just crazy. And uh, they can't go anywhere now without anybody knowing who they are and uh, asking for prayer and asking for this, that, and the other. But uh, I know they wouldn't want it any other way. God has truly, truly blessed them. Well, the growth has been phenomenal, and just God's hand has been upon them. And so they are currently in a building program where they are building an addition onto their church of 26,000 square feet, 25, 26,000 square foot addition to their current facility and uh, a 900 and some seat sanctuary they're getting ready to build. And uh, so you be praying for them and the God is doing some wonderful, marvelous things there. I've had the opportunity to preach for him numerous times. What a great church, but it all starts at the top. It all starts with leadership, and they are doing a phenomenal job, and I believe the best is yet to come for them. I want you to stand to your feet, and I want you to welcome my dear friend, Pastor Chad, as he comes to minister today. Would you put your hands together?
Come on, let him know that you love and appreciate him. He's very, very busy, pastoring a growing, busy church. Let him know you appreciate him being with us today here at LifePoint Church. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for that incredible introduction. Uh, you make me look a whole lot better than I am. Uh, I am so honored to be here um, just to see what God is doing at LifePoint Church and what this day is about, about celebrating your pastors and honoring them. Um, and I think it's a very um, uh, noble thing to do, and I, I also think it's the right thing to do. Uh, when I see a church who um, is reaching people like you guys are reaching, growing like you're growing, with the heart that you have, I know that that all starts with leadership, that all of that hinges on leadership. And we understand that in the kingdom of God, that faith is the currency of the kingdom, but honor is the culture of the kingdom. And the scripture says that we are to give double honor to those who labor in word and in doctrine. Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie, uh, thank you for being you. Thank you for your heart for people, your heart for this area. Um. We know that you love this church, you love this city, you love what God is doing here. And I, I want to personally thank you for sowing into that adoption. Um, that meant the world to Karen and myself to see that dream become a reality. And um, Pastor Ken was one of the guys who would come and preach for me when we only had 70 people. Uh, there was not a line of people waiting to come to Bethesda Church to preach, but he came and invested in me when we were just getting started. And I just want to say thank you for serving God so faithfully, so diligently over the years. Um, Life Point Church, I hope that you never take for granted the leadership that God has entrusted you. The Bible says about pastors that, that they are gifts that he has given to the body. And I think you ought to take about 30 seconds and lose your mind for the gift of Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie and their family. Come on, let them know that you appreciate them. Love this family and what they are doing. So excited um, about the word. I want to talk to you today about this subject, and I think it fits with the day. I think it fits with the theme of teamwork and everybody's jersey. And by the way, LeBron James. Come on, somebody. My goodness, he just makes it look way too easy. I want to be like him when I grow up. All right, I want to talk to you about hands up, hands under, and hands on. Hands up, hands under, and hands on. Everybody say that with me. One, two, three, go. Hands up, hands under, hands on. One of the best ways that you can honor this couple today is that you get involved in the life and the vision of LifePoint Church. Great leaders, and, and I've seen this over the years studying great leaders, great leaders have a desire for the people that they lead to become great. You need to know this about your pastors. They have a desire for you to become great, not only here at the church, but in your personal walk with God, in your job, in your career, in your marriage. They have a desire for you to become great. And we know that as children of God that we have the ability. Jesus taught us something very powerful in, in what we call the Lord's Prayer. He said that we have the ability to bring heaven into the earth. One of the things that brings heaven into the earth is something that we call service. Everybody say service. There's a powerful principle on serving that brings the kingdom into um, our world, into our community, into the atmosphere in which we live. And we know that Jesus was the greatest leader who ever lived, and he did not lead with an iron fist but Jesus led with a servant's heart. While so many people are searching for a title or a position, Jesus simply picked up a towel and he modeled servant leadership. And he even told us that if you want to become great, and so that tells me that it's okay to have a desire to become great, but he said if you want to become great, then you need to become a servant. 
And I want to get real today, and I, I kind of labored over preaching this kind of word on a day like today, but I really feel that God is wanting to say something to this house this weekend. Serving is usually not at the top of our list. Um, if, we're, if we're getting real today about our lives, you know, we wouldn't play serving in our top ten. But the truth is, everybody here has gifts, talents, and abilities. You are uniquely designed. Nobody else has your DNA, your thumbprint. God has designed you and given you specific talents and gifts so that they can be used in serving others to bring the kingdom of heaven into this city, into this region. And so the problem that we have is, and this is not a Life Point Church problem or a Bethesda Church problem, this is a church in America problem, is that we have an entertainment-based culture where people want to come to church, but they want to watch a show. They, they, they want ministry to be done for them, but they just want to occupy a seat. Uh, I want you to do me a favor real quick. Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. It's a little different today. Now, I want you to turn around, and I want you to look at that seat. Everybody look at it. That's not your calling. All right? Okay, all right, you can sit back down. You can sit back down. (laughs) You're like, where's he going with this? Jesus said the people who find their life are the ones who are willing to lose their life. You cannot find who you really are until you are willing to give yourself up. When you invest in other people, when you invest in God's work, your life becomes multiplied. Jesus said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, that it will remain alone. But if a seed falls to the ground and dies, it will produce a great harvest. So your life is a seed. Some people refuse to see themselves um, as a seed, as something to be invested, and so their lives remain unfruitful. And I want to encourage you to invest your life because here's the point that we all need to grab hold of today. Self-absorbed people, check this out, self-absorbed people live unfulfilled and unsatisfied lives. Why, why is that the case? Because satisfaction and fulfillment, that, that does not enter into our lives through taking. Fulfillment does not come into our life through taking. Only through giving. If you have been raised your entire life to be a taker, to be someone who receives, then you're going to go through life unfulfilled and unsatisfied. But if you could ever get your life moving in a direction that you're willing to invest in people that have no ability to ever pay you back, then you will eventually find why God placed you on the earth. See, the scripture tells us that it's better to give than it is to receive. See, the person who only walks in receiving or taking never really understands the power of blessing. See, you can have everything. You can accumulate stuff. But if you're not a giver, if you're not a server, you will never really understand blessing. And so the church has a dilemma. We live in a culture where everybody wants to be served but nobody wants to serve. Now, how many believe that we need to challenge that mentality? Oh, we're going to patty cake. Come on, how many believe we need to challenge that? We, 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 need to, we need to push back against that because the church is not the gathering of a crowd. The Apostle Paul said that we are living stones fitted together. In other words, we're not just a pile of rocks who gather and just sit here. We are living stones, and we are called to make a difference. See, this applies to your home just like it applies to your church. Think about this. The first day in your marriage, you wake up, and you say, what's in it for me? How many know that's the first day your marriage is going to go on a downward spiral? The moment you make it about you and your needs being met, you have missed the, 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 the definition of marriage. That marriage, when we're married, we know that it means I'm giving up 
my wants and my desires, and it's not about me any longer, and I'm going to serve you. I'm in covenant with you. And the same applies to the house of God. Now, what we have to do is we have to tie serving with diligence. All right? We have to tie the two together. Look at this verse in Proverbs 13 and 4. I'm going to use this as a launching pad. It says, the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Now, I want to read it from the NIV. It says, the sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Solomon didn't say that the pocket of a lazy man desires and has nothing. Solomon says here that the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing. People who are not diligent, all right, they live their lives unfulfilled. The diligent person, though, on the other hand, he is, he is made rich and he is fully satisfied, which leads me to this point. Empty people are selfish people. Empty people are selfish people. If there is a hole in your soul, it's probably because you're selfish. It's almost like we treat church like some kind of government bailout system. That we want to come and receive, and we want the church to be there for us. If we ever get in a bind, pastor better show up. Uh, we, we, they better rally around me. They better help me. We, they need to bail me out, but we don't want to bring anything to the table. Oh, man, maybe I picked the wrong day to do this. The, see, we, we want to treat it like a bailout system, and um, what we have to understand, the first mass deliverance that God ever performed was delivering the children of Israel off of a system. Now, before I go here, I, I, I'm not saying I'm against government aid or government assistance or, or anything, but what you got to understand, that is meant to sustain you for a season, not to be your bread and butter all the days of your life. So God said, I want to deliver you off the system of Egypt. Because in Egypt, Pharaoh told them when to go to bed. He told them when to get up. He told them how much money they could make. He told them everything about their life. Pharaoh dictated their potential. And so God wanted to deliver them off of that system and that their potential would no longer be defined by Pharaoh, but their potential would be defined by what God had put on the inside of them. And you got to understand that we are New Testament believers, and the Apostle Paul says that we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. We're not going to allow the world to define our potential or our value, but God has already placed some greatness on the inside of us, and we are to use that and leverage that to serve others. Oh, I feel like preaching today. See, systems may sustain you for a season, but it cannot promote you to the next level. See, the soul of the man, not a pocket of a man, but the soul of a man remains empty as long as he is lazy. But the soul of a diligent man will be satisfied. So we have to look at the diligent person. What, what are we talking about when we talk about diligent people? Now, I have met diligent people. I like to consider myself a diligent person. But what does it mean to be diligent? See, I believe that a diligent person is someone who gives immediate attention to an instructed task. Like, not you give somebody a task and they say, I'll do it tomorrow. Or I'll get to that. A diligent person is a person who receives the task and they don't put it off. They give immediate attention to the task. Diligent people also know how to do a little thing for a long time until something big happens. Bethesda Church, a lot of people look, how in the world did you get a 1,000 people? We've been slowly dripping the right stuff for a long time. And it, how many know that, that a small drip of water hitting a rock, if it does it consistently over time, eventually one small drip of water that consistently drips will actually change the formation of a rock. And so I'm saying sometimes your breakthrough is not overnight. Sometimes your marriage is not changed overnight. But when you start dripping the right stuff consistently over time, 
time, things begin to change. So a lot of people go through life and make no difference because they're self-centered. That, that, that's the thing the church is having to push against. Everybody's so selfish. It's kind of like the wealthy businessman who made millions of dollars buying buildings and businesses and turning them over for a profit. And he had made millions and millions of dollars. Extremely wealthy, could buy anything that he wanted. And one afternoon his lawyer walked into his office and said, Hey, we just closed on another deal. Here's what you made. And the wealthy businessman stared off into space and he did not reply. And the lawyer was very confused. He was like, Why? Are you sitting there like that? Aren't you happy? That's what we do is we make money. And the businessman replied back. He said, we're not helping anybody. We're not building people. We're not making anyone else better. His soul was in want, even though he could walk out of his office and buy anything he wanted. His soul was empty. Why? Because he was selfish. See, Jesus' disciples argued on one occasion over who the greatest was. Now, what I find interesting about that story is as they're arguing about who the greatest is, they left Jesus out of the conversation. How in the world can you walk with Jesus and have a conversation about who's the greatest and he's not in it? You ever thought about that? Think about it. on another occasion, a man approached Jesus about, uh, or a, a mom approached Jesus about two sons, two of her sons, and she said to Jesus, which one's going to get to sit at your right hand? Look at what Jesus said about this in Matthew 20, 26. He says, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Serving is the pathway to promotion. Servanthood is the gateway to promotion. This is natural and it's spiritual. It's how it works in the kingdom. It's how it works at your job. See, you serve your way in to leadership. You serve your way in to promotion. And three of our last four hires, Pastor Ken, at Bethesda Church were full-time hires from within. People who served their way into a full-time job at our church. Come on, hit your neighbor and say, you can serve your way to promotion. Tell them that. You can serve your way to promotion. Now, Jesus also said this. He said, if you suffer with me, you will reign with me. See, if you're willing to go through some stuff with me, I'll reward that. And serving is the key to your future. And lead, what you got to understand is leaders will always pursue you if you have a servant's heart. You, you, won't, you won't have to be looking for opportunities. Opportunities will come looking for you if you have a servant's heart. And, but what you have to understand is, is you can only be promoted by the person who gave you the instruction. I'm going somewhere. Supervision is not to constrain you, but it's meant to be a blessing to you. Um, you cannot be promoted unless something is over you. Check this out. The Bible doesn't say promotion comes from God. The Scripture actually says that promotion comes from above. How are you going to be promoted when there's nothing over you? you got to have something over you. How can you be promoted if there's no one over you? And what we need to know is God has qualified someone to help move us from where we are to where God has called us to be. Which brings me to this truth. It's more important who you follow than it is who you lead. Jesus said if you serve well, you'll also lead well. See, a lot of us, we want our big ship to come in but we refuse to row our boat. We want the dream job, but we're lazy on our current job. We, we, we got a dream job, we got something we want, but we're not willing to work hard where we are. But that's the church when I first became pastor, it was not my dream church. We had a lot of issues. A lot of issues, a lot of things that we had to change. But here's what I've learned. Big doors swing on small hinges. Yeah. 
Y'all, y'all okay? Now, we're going somewhere. This is where it, I haven't even got heavy yet. All right, I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter number 17. We're going to go to the story. You're thinking, what's the whole hands up, hands under, hands on? I'm glad you asked. We're getting to that now. It says in Exodus chapter 17, let, let me set this up. Israel has come out of Egypt, but the leadership structure that Moses had been using was now outdated, and it was what, what once was working for them was now not working. How many know that sometimes you will enter into a season where what used to work don't? And so you got to be willing to change and flow with what God is doing. That's what's happening in this story. Exodus chapter 17, starting in verse 1. It says, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord, and they camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people contended with Moses. I, I want you to underline that if you've got a Bible. Highlight it in your phone. They contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And, and the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you've brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people. That's very important. He said, Moses, you've been with them too long. You've got to get out in front of them. And take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river, and go. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, and fi- go out fight with Amalek. And I just want to insert right here, we need some fighters in the church. We need some, everything can't be, oh, we got to be nice. Sometimes you got to be willing to chop some ears off. Come on, Peter. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. I want to stop here and just say we have too many heavy-handed leaders. The burden is too big. Not enough support to handle the weight. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were red, steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Something I've learned over the ten years and you can see it in this story of of being a pastor, is that your greatest pain will oftentimes come from the people that you're trying to help the most. The people Moses is helping are now fighting him. He has led them out of bondage, out of captivity, and they're on their way to a promise that God had given them, and they are fighting him tooth and nail all along the way trying to contend with him, the scripture says. And I'm sure Moses had to say to himself, hey guys, I've been fighting Pharaoh long enough. Like we are on the same team. Why are you fighting with me? I don't have the energy to fight with you. And so in the church, what I believe has happened to a lot of leaders because most pastors quit before age 40. I believe what has happened in in a lot of churches is that their hands have become heavy. We have too many heavy-handed leaders instead of steady-handed leaders. But the only way to be steady-handed is for the people to support the work, to to help build the structure, the weight that will hold what God is doing. And so the people want to kill Moses, but let's be honest, Moses also wanted to kill the people. There's some people that didn't like me over the years, and there's some people that don't like me right now, but there's a church. You know what? I I ain't too fond of them either. So the people are fighting with Moses, and they're ready to kill him. He's probably ready to kill them. And, um, and, and what we have to know is that our church grew from about 70 to about 1,100 now. 
And here's what I'm going to tell you about that. I could get up and give you a highlight reel and show you all the salvations and all the lives change, and, and you would just think everything is awesome all the time, but it has cost me a great deal of pain to grow and, and, and allow that many people to start coming to our church because along the way, anytime there is growth, that kind of growth creates battles. And these battles are not with the devil. These battles are with people. Now, I know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but, but just hear me out for just a minute. Some of these battles are not demons we're fighting. We, we're, we're, we're contending with people with different personalities, with a different philosophy, and so we're fighting against people. And I want you to catch this, though, because what we know is that growth changes everything. Growth changes everything. Uh, the ladies can help me out right here. Because you cannot grow a baby from one month to full term without your figure changing. Come on, ladies, where are you at? Some of you are like, yeah, it changed my figure and I never got it back, bless God. Right? Like it changed, growth changes everything. Growth changes the structure of a thing. I just sense that God is saying, I'm getting ready to change some things at Life Church Point. And it's not that God is mad at anybody, but God is wanting to be able to add more weight to what He's doing in this ministry. But He needs some people to come alongside the vision and support the weight that God is getting ready to send to this house. Listen, if I were to sit on this podium, I think I've lost about 50 pounds. I think it would hold me. But if I were to sit on this, and then Pastor Ken sat on my lap, and then this brother sat on his lap, how many, no, eventually the weight will cause this thing at some point. We keep piling people up. Eventually, it's going to crumble. It's not going to be able to support the weight. And the point I'm making is you cannot keep adding people, adding their baggage, adding their past, adding their addictions, adding marriage issues, adding all these things and still be the one who has to shake all the hands, dedicate all the babies, preach all the sermons, visit all the hospitals, and get everything done. You've got to have somebody that can handle, help you handle the weight. As you add weight, you have to build structure. And I just want to say right here, give your pastors permission to change. Give them permission to change. See, one of the things that changes as you grow, as God begins to do some cool things in, in a local church, it has to move from functioning and, and I hope you hear my heart. This is not a negative. You don't see it as a negative. It has to change from just being a family atmosphere to a kingdom atmosphere. And, and what I mean by that, in, it, we are part of the kingdom, which means that we are to function under command. It means that, hey, you go here and, and you go there and you get the food ready, and you open the doors, and you park the cars, and you hold the signs, and you contact the guests, and you visit the hospital, and you pay the insurance, and you run the sound system, and you open the store, and you counsel that couple, and you meet with that team leader, and you get this video ready to go, you meet with the architect, you hit the lights, you pull the volume up, you run the social media program, you check in the kids because we are an army operating under command and we got to have more people supporting. Oh, I feel like preaching. Because here's a leadership principle. Contention is not a bad thing. I all, see, I hate conflict. Anybody identify with me? Like when there's drama in the church, you know what I want to go do? Crawl up in my bed and pull the covers over my head. Karen, please come hold me. You know, some of us just avoid conflict and contention because we think that it's always bad. But one of the things God has been teaching me over the last two years is that contention is not a bad thing. Contention is not a bad thing. Contention is an indicator that change is necessary. 
See, it, it's a flashing light on your dashboard in your car. You know that one that's been on for two years in your car? You know, that light doesn't mean you're getting ready to be broke down on the side of the road, but it does mean if you don't address the issue, eventually you are going to be broke down on the side of the road. See, that's what contention is. And so the people started contending with Moses. And God didn't say to Moses, hey, Moses, you need to run the devil out of the camp. He didn't say, go cast the devil out of those crazy people. He didn't say any of that. God spoke to Moses and told him, he said, hey, your leadership style has to change. He said, you've been leading those people, but the way you've been doing it will no longer work. He said, you've been doing it all yourself for so long, and, and, and what you've missed out, Moses, is that you haven't mobilized all those people to help you out. And what I love about Life Point Church is that this is a place where God wants to use your gifts, where this leadership wants you to tap into your gifts, not so that you can just say, I got a gift, but so that you can bring that gift to the table to help us move this thing. Wouldn't it be amazing that whenever, whenever you build that building that you're building and what you're uh, working towards, wouldn't it be amazing if God said, man, they've been working so diligent, they're using their gifts, I can trust them with a harvest, I'm going to send them five. 500 new people. Now see, the claps get smaller, but here's what we have to understand. Until we become a church for the unchurched, we're not ready for the harvest. See, I prayed long ago, and, and, and it was in a season where we were not growing, and I, I asked God, God, where's the new people? Why, why aren't people getting saved, and where's the harvest, and God spoke to my heart and said, you're not ready for the harvest. And as I began to pray through that and read the scripture, God, God spoke to my heart and said, hey, you would actually do more damage to the harvest than you would good. He said, because you and your people that you're leading are not ready to steward them. You're not ready to disciple them. And the way God put it to me was, if I send you 200 new people this coming week, what would you do with them? Are you ready to equip them and release them. So God started building a structure so that the people could be developed and the needs of the people could be addressed and there could be a greater emphasis on the people getting involved. And, and when, a, when a pastor starts a church like this, like Life Point Church, there is a season that Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie have to be with the people. Can I get one amen? There is a season that Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie had to be with the people. When I, when I became pastor of Bethesda, there was a season I had to be with the people. What did that look like? It meant every birthday party I was invited to, I was there. Every hospital visit, I was there. Everything going on, I was there. I was with the people. But here, here's the thing. That was 10 years ago. I spent all my time with the people. And you can't skip that, that step. You can't skip that step because people have to prove your leadership. There, there's a season that that happens. But we, as we grew, our structure had to change. And I couldn't be everything to everyone. But we started tapping into the gifts that God had sent to the house to start meeting the needs of the people. Now, let me say it like this. God intended for the disciples to smell like Jesus. So that if you got Peter, you got Jesus. If you got Matthew, you got Jesus. If you got James or John, you still got Jesus. There is a season that the leader has to be among the people. But there is also where a season where it changes and you've been around the leader long enough that you've picked up on the scent and it doesn't matter if it's Pastor Ken that goes to the hospital or if it's you, you are an extension of the same anointing God has placed on him. Come on, somebody, help me out today. God, you, you, you are an extension of what God is doing in this house. And so th there is a season that the leader has to be with the people, but then God told Moses, he said, you've been with the people long enough. Now, Moses, get out in front of them. You've been kissing babies too long, Moses. Shaking hands too long, Moses. See, if you stay too long amongst the people, and I've watched this with my father in ministry. If you stay too long amongst the people, they get too familiar with you. 
and they can no longer distinguish between you and your gift, you and your anointing. They get so familiar that you, are, you, are, you, you become a buddy and not a man of God. Is this okay? If you don't have me back, I understand, Pastor. See, that ride for, for us at our church, when these transitions started really happening, it was the bumpiest ride that I had ever experienced. Because during this season, during those transitions, it was a lot of people that I thought would never walk out, walked out. And, and, and the truth is, some of the people that left our ministry, you know what the number one reason people are left our ministry, Pastor Ken, when we started really growing and hundreds of people started getting saved? It's too big. What they were really saying is, you can't be my best friend, Pastor. It's too big. Well, you're not going to like heaven. Because I hate to inform you, there's going to be more people than just you and your four there. There's going to be a sea of people there. And so I think part of the problem is that the sheep don't understand the separation. And I'm not saying that they should understand the separation. They start thinking, well, you know, he's too big for his britches. He's gotten arrogant. Not understanding, listen, I want you to catch this, that when God moves them higher, it's because he wants to move you higher. Now, we pray, God, do big things, take us higher. But how many know what's on the head gets on the body? Jesus said, if you will suffer with me, you will also reign with me. God never moves a man by himself. If he moves a man, it's to move the sheep. It also means that the leader then moves out of the role of doing, okay, into the role of leading. What does that do? It opens up vacancies. It opens up opportunities. I tell our staff, our team leaders, you need, you need to raise somebody up. Even on a team leader level, you need to raise somebody up on that team that if you drop dead tomorrow could do your job. That we are always creating room for other people to get involved. See, many of the empty places of our lives is nothing more than us being a taker instead of a giver. But it is the diligent person who is fulfilled. And contention, get this about contention. Contention is normal when people have to work together. Come on, anybody ever had contention at work? How I many, most of the time, if you're mad at, at your job, it's not, you know, it's not with a computer screen. You're mad at somebody. There's contention with a person there. And so contention is a normal thing. See, there, there, there's usually even a, a place in raising children. Where a child will get to a place where they want to contend with you. What do you have to do in that setting? You have to stop being a buddy and start being a parent. Right? Because they are contending. See, when a church becomes contentious, it means that leadership, okay, that there's, there's a structural change taking place. Um, and so God told Moses, he said, they are contentious because they are too familiar with you. So I want you to go out in front of them. And so God speaks to him and tells him, he says, these people need leadership and you're going to have to change the way you're doing it, Moses. You're going to have to get more people involved. And that is the way the kingdom is supposed to function. What would happen? I used to say it'd be great if we had a thousand people at Bethesda. You know what I say now? I, it would be great if we had a thousand people serving at Bethesda. If we could somehow tap in to everyone's gifts, see the battle starts and as long as Moses' arms, the Bible says, as long as his arms are up, they win. But if his arms fall, they get too heavy, they lose. See, you're going to have to get more people involved. And I believe that good leadership is training people to walk in the same victory that you walk in. That's great leadership. Good leadership is not someone who keeps you ignorant and dependent, but good leadership is people who will release you. And that's what this church is about. See, if you need someone to do everything for you, then you are, you are stuck as a child in your faith. If you need somebody else to cast the devil out of your house, you're still dwarfed in your faith. 
At some point, how many know as the body of Christ, as the hands and feet of Jesus, we ought to be able to go and do what has been done for us, and we, are to, we ought to be at a place where we can do that for others. See, that, that is being the body of Christ. That's what God wants to do. And so Joshua was a fighter. The Bible points that out. Every church needs some fighters. See, Moses was wise enough to know who his fighters were and who his fighters were not. Good leadership can not only, they not only recognize their own gifts, but they recognize the gifts in others. See, when people are out of place, I want you to get this, when people are out of place, they cause contention. You got to get the right people in the right place. Because you can have the right people, but if they're out of place, they will still cause contention. And when contention rises, it's not the devil, okay? It's not that. It's simply, you know, they can't sing and they shouldn't be on the worship team. That's not the devil. You can't sing, honey. We hate to tell you that. We, we know mommy and daddy said you would win American Idol, but you're really bad at this. But you know what? You're really good at this. Let's, let's move you there. And, and so we got to be willing to be honest with those conversations. Like, you know, have you ever been to church and, and you walk in and they got like this person out front and they got the worst personality. They haven't smiled in seven years. And that's who's greeting the folks. Now, here again, everybody has gifts and talents. But if you haven't smiled in seven years, hey, we love you. We appreciate you but you're not going to be the face of this ministry. We got something back here in the office for you to do. Hey, put those stamps on the envelopes and mail them out, all right? Put them in a back corner somewhere and let them use, come on somebody, let them use their gifting. See, what do you do with those crazy happy people? You know the people are happy all the time? Tell them to go out front and be happy. See, it doesn't matter what kind of equipment you have. You have a place in the kingdom. Every person has a place. Moses was wise enough that he did not tell Aaron to fight. Aaron was not a fighter. He told Joshua to fight. Joshua always fights. And when you look at Joshua, he's always fighting and looking for a fight. Even when the angel of the Lord showed up, what did Joshua do? He drew his, his sword and he said to God's angel, he said this, are you with us or with them? He was going to fight God. He, he, was, he was always fighting. As crazy as Peter was, Jesus always kept Peter around. He never got rid of him. I think every, every church needs some crazy people like Peter. I mean, one moment he's cussing, one moment he's lying, one moment he's cutting somebody's ear off. We need some crazy people that know how to fight in the church, come on somebody, to get something done. We got some people at Bethesda Church, man, if you cross it, I promise, they'll fight you. They will fight, listen, and they will fight for the vision. They will fight for what we're about. There's people that have criticized me to, to the wrong people. And I'm telling you, they, they criticize me to fighters that support me. And I'm telling you, that was a mistake. Come on, hit your neighbor and say, we need some fighters. See, I can't get my hands on, a, on 200 kids on a Sunday, but the Bethesda kids team can do that. I can't play drums and keyboards or a guitar or even sing, but we got a worship team that can handle that. I can't preach and change diapers and preach and open up doors, but we have people willing to make the vision happen. I'm saying there is a place for you. God has designed you. He wants to move this thing on down the field, but you got to use your gifts and your talents to make it happen. Now, Pastor Ken, come up here. We're going to illustrate it now. Y'all ready for this? Come on. Anybody give me five minutes? Five, ten, fifteen? No, I'm just kidding. All right. Pastor Ken right here. Now, I'm going to grab these three brothers. Come here. Because i got to give you the picture. Let's get over here where they can see you. Come over here, Pastor Ken. You're going to be Moses. Yes. I think that's fitting. Hands up. Everybody say hands up. 
All right, Aaron, come here. You hold this arm. Her, come here. You hold this arm. You're Joshua. Come here. I want you to look like you're ready to kill somebody, whatever that looks like. Now, I love it. All right, check this out. Everybody say, hands up, hands under, hands on. Okay, check this out. Joshua is your fighter, but not everybody is a fighter. Okay? Not everybody is a hands-on fighter. These are the people, listen, Joshua's are the people in the ministry that can take what you have and make it better. Like, we, one of the core values at, for our staff is always leave it better than you found it. Always leave it better than you found it. So Joshua, they're hands-on, and they are fighting. They are making things better. These people right here, Aaron and her, they are the ones that support. Okay? This is the hands-under. Everybody say hands-under. Okay, they are supporting. Why? Because we have too many heavy-handed leaders. The weight is too great. I mean, if I make him stand there long enough, even with them helping him, his hands will get tired. Come on. But, but the support comes from Aaron and her, those who are help, helping shoulder the weight. And, and there's, there's a great group of these kind of people. Everybody say support. support. There's a lot of support people that God has sent to Life Point Church. But the problem is these people usually get close to Moses. All right? Now, why, why is it? it's not a problem, but here's, here's the thing as a leader that I've had to learn. You have to be able to discern what's in Aaron and her's heart as they support because some people are here to really support, but some people want to get close so they can find out the scoop. Oh, yeah. If, if they don't invite me back, I'll understand why. Now, now here's the part. Man, I, this, this is the part right here. Everyone can have Moses' anointing, but not everyone can have Moses. What, what, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Jesus' ministry, Joshua, you need to look like you're fighting. I'm just playing with you. Jesus' ministry touched thousands, right? But only 12 had him. Pastor Ken, his gifting and his anointing, I know this man's heart. I know Pastor Jamie's heart. They want what God has put in them to touch thousands, but they can't give themselves to thousands. I'm going to go a little further right here, okay? Check this out. Your gift and you are not the same thing. Everybody can have my gift, but not everybody can have me. We went through a season about year five or six, Pastor Ken, where I didn't have enough of this. I, had, I didn't have enough support. And, and so I had the martyr syndrome. I got to do God's will. I got to get it done. If we don't get it done, nobody, it won't get done. And so I kept running. I was going night and day, 70 hours a week, seven days a week, 80 hours a week. Got, and, and, and every time, listen, what really happened to me, to, to my family, is that my marriage came under attack, that I wasn't the husband I needed to be. Why? Because I was trying to give myself to hundreds of people. But you can only give yourself to a few. Everybody can have the gift, but not everybody can have Pastor Ken. Are, are you all following me, or is this like deer in a headlight moment? Now, y'all don't move. I'm, I'm going to let you go in a second. My iPad went black. Can't happen. All right. Now, and the reason this is so important is that people will take your gift and they'll use you. So we have to separate. There's only going to be so many people that can get close to this leadership team. How many know if God gives this church 1,000 people, how many know Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie can't give themselves to all 1,000? They give their gift to millions, but they can only give themselves to so many. 
And that's where the fighters come in. That's where the support people come in. And I want you to check this out. This is, this is the beautiful part of the whole thing. Israel didn't win just because Moses' hands were steadied and up. Israel won because Moses' hands were up. The support team did what they were called to do. And Joshua was out cutting people's heads off like he was supposed to do. And when they all did what they were supposed to do, God gave them the victory over their enemies. Hands up, hands under, and and hands on. Amen. Come on, give God a praise for that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See, the church should be full of people that are making it better. Should be full of people making it better. Israel prevailed because they worked together. See, all over this building, there are Joshua's. There are Aaron's, there are hers, there's, there's people that are, that are called to support, to shoulder some of the load, so that Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie, and when we went through that season, Pastor Karen and myself, they were, they, it was just bad. And, and it was so bad that at times, and I don't think she would care for me sharing this with you, that she really started hating the church. And it was because I had given myself to everyone all in the name of Jesus' will. And, you know, they're all going to hell. I got to pull them out, you know. Had this Superman complex. And, and I can remember when it hit me. We got home from a little vacation. We had taken a few days off. And when we came home, it was late at night. And I told her, I said, I'm going to go to the church. And it was late. She's like, what in the world are you going to do at the church? And then she, she just looked at me and she said these words. She said, go on to the church. Go ahead and hang out with your mistress talking about the church. Because I had given myself to everyone for so long, I had neglected the most important people in my life. See, at the end of the day, if I don't pastor my family first, I have missed God's will. So I had to make some... Ma yeah, you can clap for that because... How many know men, it ain't easy to say, hey, honey, you were right. You were right. I was giving myself to everyone and not to my own family. So, Life Point Church, how are you going to change a city, a region? How are you going to reap a harvest? You're going to have to make sure that this family, that their hands are up and steady. You're going to have to support the work, and you're going to have to be willing to fight to take new ground. And I believe that if you're willing to do that, God will add to this house and he will multiply. Listen, Ezekiel 37, the bones, the structure came together and then God sent the flesh. The harvest comes when we're ready for it. And I believe there is a harvest on the way for Life Point Church. I want you to stand to your feet. I hope I didn't preach too long. Everybody say hands up, hands under, hands on. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? I'm going to do a couple of things right here. First and foremost, I never close a, a sermon, a, a message, a service that I do without giving somebody an opportunity to know Jesus. So as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around for the next couple of minutes. If you're in this place today and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not right with God. I need Jesus to forgive me. I need him to save me. I want to make sure that I leave this place differently than I came in. If that is you today, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out or any of that. But if that's you, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life today. Just, just by the show of your hand, would you just throw your hand up and say, that's me. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Anyone at all. Just high enough for me to see it. Thank you for this hand. God bless you. Anyone, thank you for that hand back there. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Before we pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want every voice lifted. There's at least two hands that went up, and I want them to know that we're with them and for them. So I want us to pray this out loud, loud enough where we can hear it with our own ears. Every voice lifted. Let's say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe 
that you came, lived a sinless life, died in my place, and on the third day, you rose again. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've committed sins. I need a Savior. I can't save myself. So today, I humble myself, and I ask you to forgive me for all my sins. I repent of those sins, and I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise for those two hands. God bless you. Those two people that prayed, I want to encourage you that before you leave, I don't know how, how uh, LifePoint does it. I'm just a guest preacher who, you know, driving in and driving out. and So I, I'm not part of that follow-up. But please tell somebody. Tell somebody before you leave. Let them know who you are. Maybe even let Pastor, one of, one of the staff, and somebody know that you, you gave your life to Christ so they can help you take your next step. The next thing I want to do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got two things to do. But this one's very important. Both of these are really important. If you're in this place today and and after this message on hands up, hands under, and hands on, that you would say, you know what? I could do more to make this vision go further. I could maybe give more of my time, more of my talent, more more of my treasure to make sure that what God is doing at LifePoint Church that it moves at an accelerated pace. I could do more. I'm not going to ask you to bow your head. I just want to see hands that will go up and say, you know what, I, I could do more with the gifts and talents. I want you to leave them up high. Leave them up high. Leave them up high. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every hand that's lifted right now, for every person that today they're recognizing that they could do more. God, to help take this vision to the next level. God, I sense in my heart today, God, that you have big, big plans for this house. God, you're going to utilize this people right here, this group of people, God, to change a city. And God, we just pray that every gift that you have have deposited in this room, God, help us as leaders and staff to help pull out that potential so that people can use their gifts to advance God's kingdom. I pray, God, for a boldness over every hand that's up right now. God, that they would not, God, take a back seat, but God, they would bring those gifts and talents to the forefront. God, help us to reach more people than ever before. God, help us to do that. Help us to reach the harvest. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Can you give the Lord a big clap offering today? Come on, give, give God praise. You may be seated for just a moment. At this time, we are going to receive a very special offering for Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie. We want to give you an opportunity to sow into this couple. And I'm going to ask the ushers, if you would, to to get in place. And as I said earlier, I think one of the things that happens when I get the opportunity, I don't travel a whole lot because I have a lot of responsibilities with I don't know, I feel like I'm raising an army at, at the house, uh, four kids and uh, all that and in the church. And, and so, but when I travel to other places, I think a lot of times we, we miss out on the blessing that's right in front of us, the gifts that God has given us. And God has truly given this house a gift in Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie. They have a deep desire for you, a love for you and your family and for this community. And listen, they want to see God do some big, big things. And the scripture is very clear. You cannot honor God without honoring people. It's impossible. You can't separate the two. And these are choice servants of God and we want to sow into them today. We want to, do you know part of, part of this, giving to them an offering today, that, that is a way of helping steady their hands. It's a way of supporting what God has put in them. So I want you to take just a moment. Ushers are about in place and prepare an offering to give. And let's, let's maybe do double what you're thinking. The Bible says double honor. Maybe you thought of an amount. Maybe you ought to double that amount. 
But let's bless the man and woman of God today. All right? Is that okay? Come on, let's, is that all right? Let's bless the man and woman of God today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this awesome, awesome couple, God. Thank you for this family that have, God, they have dedicated their entire lives to ministry, God, to leading your people. And God, they do it with a servant's heart and with diligence. And God, we believe today, Father, that you have blessed this house with these gifts. And God, we want to show our honor and appreciation today, God, by giving in an offering to them. God, we just pray that this, this offering would be a blessing, God, to Pastor Ken and Pastor Jamie. And God, we ask that you would, God, just continue to use this house to reach more and more people for you. In Jesus' name, amen. That was just an amazing message. Thank you so much, Pastor Chad. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedule, for spending the day with us today. We really appreciate it. And what a timely message, be it Pastor Appreciation Day or any other day. Thank you so much. Um, I know that the hour is getting late, so I promise that I will not labor here long. Um, Pastor and Jamie, today we are naming you our official MVPs here at LifePoint Church. You're both our most valuable players. Your hard work, your dedication, your teamwork, and your diligence are what part of what makes LifePoint the amazing church and thriving church that it is today. We are so blessed and we are so thankful to have your leadership here. And we're so excited to see what God has in store for you personally and for our church over this next year ahead. <clears throat> My heart over um, talking to everybody about this today was really to try to impress upon you that I want our goal for pastor to be so blessed that he doesn't have time to be stressed because we're moving and we're growing and we're getting ready to embark upon a building and be a building or property or whatever. And he needs time and he needs focus to focus on those things. You know, we need to remember that um, he's not just our pastor, but he's a guy and he has a life and he has a family and he has responsibilities and his car breaks and he stubs his toe and he gets, gets, he gets a hangnail and he wants to take a nap, you know, like all of us do, right? And those chances uh, for things like that, what he's trying to take care of all of us. So I just want you guys to commit to pray for him, to help take care of him in your prayer life on a daily basis. If you forget on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, but try to pray for him and pray for Jamie because um, it's so important moving forward. If we're going to grow, we have to support them, like Pastor Chad said. And I had no idea what he was preaching about today, so just so you know. But we have to. We have to support them moving forward. So if you guys could commit to pray for them so that he can concentrate on letting God's Spirit move through him so that he can deliver that to us so that we could grow that would be the best gift that you could give them today, okay, and moving forward. You guys want to come up here with us? And I would like it, too, if Morgan and Brittany and Adam could come. That would be awesome, too. I want to I do the box first. So we just have a few um, gifts for you. And one of them is this box that Susie's going to hand to Pastor. I'm standing right <laughs> Building one life at a time. <laughs> And, um, Pastor, we would be, um, well, we would not be with our theme for today if you did not walk out of this building without tickets to some sort of a game. So, um, not 
quite that soon, um, but those are actually Indians tickets, so you can be outside and enjoy the nice weather. That was kind of our goal after this terrible winter that we've had. Um, and Jamie, we have a gift for you. Um, that should help with some of your, um, like, I don't know, decorating needs. There you go. There you go. Um, also, uh, the church decided to bless you with kind of like a DIY home makeover gift this year. So we're just blessing you with some money to do whatever you want to do in your house. And, um, you know, have a ball. <laughs> and then also, um, we have uh, some small gifts for um, Brittany and Adam and Morgan. Because, you know, this really is a team family effort. Um, the three of these young people do so much to help in this church every Sunday, too. There's things that you see that they do, but there's a lot of things that you don't see that they do, too. Um, so it's just important that we recognize them as well and let them know how much we love and appreciate them. Just a real quick reminder, we are having a party after service in the cafeteria, but I'm going to give the mic now to Pastor so that he can close us out for the day, okay? Thank you. Amen. I know, um, real quick, let Jocelyn and her team know how much you appreciate them and all the hard work. She works very hard at keeping me in the dark about days like today, which drives me absolutely crazy needing to know what's going on. But anyhow, she does a great job this year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, Pastor, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for that encouraging and inspiring message. And to each and every one of you, thank you. You, you don't know how much you mean to us. And um, we're so thankful and honored that God has brought all of us together for such a time as this. We love you. We thank God for you. And we feel like the best is yet to come. Amen. Let's stand together. I think some people are going to help us as we go out these two doors our way to the back part. Those of you that raised your hand for salvation here at the altar, we have our altar workers that will be here to take that information from you. If you'll just give us 30 seconds, we'd love to have that information. Amen. Father, I thank you and I praise you for each and every one here, those that are watching online, Lord, those that couldn't be here, those that are serving, those that are helping, those that are fighting, those, God, that are laboring with us. We give you the praise and glory for them. As we depart from this place, Lord, we honor you, we magnify you, and we glorify you, for there is none like you in all the earth. We ask you bless the next, uh, we ask that you bless our the food that we're about to receive. We ask God that you bless our time of fellowship, and we'll never cease to give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And everyone shouted, amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you just in a few moments.